hope I didn't you up too much. I shifted us this way. Nah, we're good. So, so you want to hang out? But it won't prosper When the darkness falls It won't prevail Cause the God I serve Knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm going to see a victory I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages he will win And I'm not backing down from any giant I know how the story is Yes, I know how the story is I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Father, take all of this evil. Turn it into good. You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Sing that with us You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Oh yes you do You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Sing it out to him You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant and you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. For the battle belongs to you. Oh, the battle belongs 
Guys, we are going to see a victory, no matter what. No matter what you've heard, no matter what this world's telling us, God is in control. We are his people. We his peeps. He loves us more than anything. More than anything. And that's what's so incredible. Because you know, when he's here with us, no matter where we're at, here, work, home, in the grocery store, he's living inside of us. His Holy Spirit. Guys, I want to welcome you to the bridge. The people that are watching at home, hey, we love you there. Get a cup of coffee, get a donut, and praise his name. Because you know what? When he's here, miracles happen. Son, Spirit, come in power. <laughs> Send your fire, consume us with your love, only your love. Our eyes are fixed upon your face, our hearts cry out, come and have your way. Come and have your way. and poor are coming to taste and see the wonders of your grace oh father our eyes are fixed upon your face our hearts cry out come and have your way sing it out to me come and have your way When heaven touches earth, we stand amazed, we shout your praise. When heaven touches earth, your kingdom come, your will be done. When heaven touches earth, we stand amazed, we shout your praise. When heaven touches earth, We shout your praise. Father, when you're here, miracles happen. Miracles happen. When you are here, miracles are possible. When you are here, Father, freedom reigns and healing comes. When you are here, guilt and shame. Come and have 
You make my heart your home Forever, yes you did You made my heart your home Forever You made my heart your home Forever So come and have your way in us So come and have your way in our family So come and have your way in our church So come and have your way Guys, let me pray. Father, we love you so much. And I know we're damaged and we're living in a world that tries to turn us from you. But it can't. It tries to press us down from saying your name in front of people. But it can't. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit fill us. Fill this vessel to shout your name, to tell someone about your loving grace, your lovingness to love us no matter where we've been, deep in the valley in a mud pit, covered. You love us so much. You see the potential in us to be someone that we don't even think we can become. You see underneath all of the dirt of who we are, what we can become when we talk about you, when we pray about you, when we love you. Father, everything that happens in this room through Kevin's message, the music is for your glory, no one else. It's to honor you, King of Kings, in that throne room. We love you, Father, with all of our hearts. In your loving name, amen. Good morning, guys. Welcome to the bridge. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. It's good to be here with you. My name is Kevin Witt. I'm the pastor here at the bridge. Uh, we are continuing our series in the book of Philippians. Uh, so we'll be in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Um, we'll, uh, I'll start reading in chapter, or in, uh, in verse 7 of chapter 3, but uh, really um, kind of verses 12 through 21 is where we'll focus um, this morning. Uh, Paul's going to um, describe to us uh, the Christian life this morning um, by giving us illustrations of what uh, the Christian life should look like. And illustration and example is a, a powerful form of teaching. It's a powerful teaching tool that if you can um, take something that um, you're trying to get somebody to understand, um, trying um, to instruct somebody in, and connect that to something that they already understand, um, that's a powerful tool. I think that's why um, we have so many, um, so much of our, our culture is defined in, in sports terms, uh, that we use sports vocabulary to communicate things that has, has nothing um, to do um, with um, with, with sports, but rather you know, we use that as an illustration. We use that um, as example. Um, there's a lot that we connect um, in, in that way. I um, uh, heard a joke this week. Um, a, a worship pastor, um, as I was meeting with some other pastors and, and praying with them, um, shared this joke with me uh, from a sports analogy. And uh, it was uh, the story of a, a pastor, an elder, and a deacon um, that were out in the woods hunting. Um, they are um, about 100 yards apart, but they're, they're situated such that a deer walks into um, their sights all at the same time, and each of them fires a shot almost 
simultaneously and the deer drops. Um, they all go out there and they start arguing about who killed the deer. You know, there's only one bullet wound, so it's clear that only one of them hit it, and so they're arguing. Uh, and the pastor says, I think it was, it was my shot. Clearly, it was, I had him lined up, and Deacon said, no, no, it was me. I, I had him. And the elders arguing, too. No, clearly, I'm, I'm the guy who shot the deer. It's me. I'm the one who's responsible. And so a game warden comes walking up and says, you know, what's, what's going on here? Why do y'all, y'all seem to be arguing over this deer? And he says, well, we, we all fired at the, the same time, and we can't tell um, which of us actually shot the deer. We need to know who, who gets credit for this. And so the game warden looks him over and he says, well, clearly it's the pastor who shot this deer. And he says, well, how can you tell? And he's, are you sure? I says, Absolutely, I'm sure. Well, how do, you, how do you know? How do you know it was the pastor and not the deacon or the elder? And the game warden says, because the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> so that's a, a way that we can illustrate that there's a... Uh, an observation that sometimes we, we are, are good at remembering sermons for about 15 minutes and then we get out into life and we don't necessarily take that, that with us. I'm using that an, an analogy by sport. And Paul's going to do that for us. Uh, his primary analogy is going to be one of sport, but he's going to give us really kind of three different illustrations and examples of the Christian life um, and, and how we should be living it. Um, so, once again, Philippians chapter 3, I'll start reading in, in verse 7, but we'll begin um, focusing in verse 12. Um, but let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into it this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of your many blessings to us, for all the ways that you've provided for us so richly. Um, God, we thank you um, that we can meet together um, as your people um, safely and securely, that, um, that we can gather freely to celebrate who you are and what you've done for us. God, we thank you for the gospel. Um, we thank you, Lord, that you, um, because of the richness of your grace and your mercy and your love, that you came to rescue us, um, that you came and, and you lived for us, you died for us, you rose again um, to let us know who you are, to let us know that um, you had paid for our sins, Lord. And Lord, help us to um, take that, that truth, that amazing grace to heart so that we will live differently as your people. Um, so that we'll share that amazing news with the world that so desperately needs it. It is in your holy name we pray. Amen. So Paul has been talking to us, been talking to the church at Philippi, about the incredible value of Christ, that Christ is more valuable than anything else, that Christ is of supreme value, and it's, it's because of the value of Christ that that all of the other teachings in Philippians, um, Paul is able to state that because of the value of Christ, uh, Paul is able to say, look, I don't know if the Romans are going to let me go. I don't know if the Romans are going to kill me. But either way, to, to live as Christ, if I get to keep going on, I'll, I'll keep preaching the gospel. To live as Christ, Christ will be with me. And to die is gain because to die is more Christ. Because if I die, I will be in the presence of Christ. Um, that he's going to be able to say, hey, look, I, I've learned that whether I've got um, almost nothing or whether I've got everything I need, that Christ is all I need, um, that Christ is enough, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, this is how he's going he's to be able to write to us and tell us, hey, don't just look out for yourselves, but put others first, because Christ didn't just look out for himself, but Christ stooped down to serve you, submitted himself even to death to serve you. And so all of these things that he's been able to proclaim um, in Philippians flow from the supreme value of Christ. And so uh, once again, we, we read um, this opening passage last week, but just want to um, read it because it ties into the context of, of what we're going to talk about this morning. And so Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul wrote this, he says, but whatever gain I had, whatever he had achieved apart from Christ, whatever he had attained on himself um, apart from Christ, all of his accomplishments apart from Christ, um, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any possible means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Um, so that's Paul stating the focus of his life, that, that everything he'd achieved apart from Christ, and, and he's got quite a religious resume, he says all of that is garbage, all of that is rubbish. It's, it's knowing Christ. It's the, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ that is everything to me, and that's how I live my life. And so he's going to start to illustrate what that looks like in our own lives um, um, by, by talking about how he, um, how he lives and about how we should live. And so in verse 12, he writes this. He says, not that, all, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul says, hey, look, um, I'm not perfect in any of this. That I have not gotten to a place where even as Paul, that he can, can say, hey, look, I'm, I'm just there. And y'all should just be like me because I'm there. I've, I've achieved it. I am righteous like I should be. I'm just like Christ as I should be. And, and y'all should just kind of bow at my feet. And, and he says, no, I'm, I'm not perfect either. I am still pursuing this. And, and Paul is, you know, we, we picture Paul as, as this guy, and, and, and perhaps rightfully so, that that's kind of standing up on the steeple with a cape on, flowing in the breeze, and, he's, and there's nothing you can do to him because he's like to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, bring it. You know, whatever you got, um, good. Um, that, that he's just this, this, this attempting to be this model Christian for us, and, and that's what we should all really attempt to be, but, but he, he, he's able to admit, look, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm still chasing after this. I'm still trying to live up to this because Christ has made me his. Um, that I'm not, even as Paul, even as a guy who's writing books of Scripture, I'm not perfect, but I know the one who is, and I'm aiming for him. So he says, brothers, I consider that I have made it my, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, so here's what he does, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward Towards what, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if, any, and, and if even anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we've obtained. So Paul kind of creates a, a tension here because he says we are holding true to what we've obtained. So there's a, a way in which we, we are there. There's a way in which we have attained what we're trying to get to. Because Christ has declared us righteous in himself. That Christ has declared us to be his. And so uh, we are trying to live as if we are Christ and we are Christ. And we're trying to obtain the righteousness of Christ, and Christ has given us his righteousness. And so there's, there's both a, a great effort and a great security, because we are working to be what we're not, and Christ has already declared us to be that, so we're secure. So you, you see that in Paul's writing. And what Paul is doing is Paul presents the Christian life as a race towards Jesus. Um, Paul is presenting the Christian life as a race towards Jesus. The language that he's using here, of straining forward, of not looking back, of aiming towards the goal, um, all of this is racing language. It's all um, running a race is the, the imagery that he's given us. Running was a um, popular competitive event in the ancient world. It, it still is um, today. Um, the the first 17 Olympic Games, uh, the Olympics, of course, started in, in ancient antiquity, but uh, there, the first 17 Olympic Games only had running events. Um, the only events in the, the first Olympics were running. Um, in the first one, um, the, the only event they had was an event called either the Stade or the Stade On. We get our, our word stadium from this, and it's an event where they would um, run for about um, 200 yards. Um, it's, it's approximately how far the, the stayed was, and, and they, whoever you know, got to the finish line first was the guy who won. 
Um, interesting, they would run completely naked. They would take off all their clothing um, and they would just run. That, doesn't, that seems awkward to me, doesn't seem comfortable to me, but that's what they did. Um, by the 14th Olympics, they added um, a, a second um, event, um, which was sometimes called the double stayed. And so that was, you ran the 200 yards, you turned around and you ran back. Um, so different event. And then in the 15th Olympics, they added um, an, a long distance race that was probably about three miles. Um, and so for, for quite some time, it was not until like the 18th Olympics that they added wrestling and things like that, that, that running was a very popular event at this time. And so Paul uses the imagery of running, of running a race with a goal, of running towards the goal of Christ as an illustration for the Christian life. In other places of scripture, we see this imagery, the, the idea that we should be focused on our goal, that we should be looking forward, as Paul says, um, to looking forward to Christ and not looking back at what's behind us. Um, Jesus says, um, in, in Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Um, so Jesus tells us that we're supposed to set our sights on him, that we're supposed to be looking forward. And elsewhere in Scripture, Paul uses racing language um, in order to communicate what it looks like to live as Christians. So a couple of examples. Colossians um, 2, 8, he, he says, Let no one disqualify you. Um, insisting on asceticism or worship of angels, um, going into details about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. So that language of disqualification, that there's different ways you could get disqualified in a race, and he's applying that um, to the Christian life. Galatians 5, 7, he tells them, you were running so well. What hindered you from obeying the truth? Um, so once again, Paul is using um, running language to, to communicate what it's like to live as Christians. Um, the author of Hebrews, who might be Paul, or it might be one of um, Paul's disciples, we're not really sure who wrote Hebrews, but um, the author of Hebrews uses this um, language um, similar to how Paul does. He says, this is Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the same language of, of keep your eyes set on Jesus. Throw off anything that's clinging to you, anything that's going to slow you down towards your run, your race towards Jesus. Um, one more passage. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is going to have similar language. He, he says, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So once again, there's, there's language of running, of running a race to describe the Christian life. That Paul is presenting us the Christian life illustrated as a race run towards Jesus. Now, Paul is talking about great effort on our part, but he is not talking about earning on our part. Um, if you remember the quote from Dallas Willard, I think we did last week, that, that, that grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Um, that, that grace um, is God's kindness that we don't deserve. It's God's kindness that we can't ever deserve, and so we can never earn grace. But when we rightfully understand grace, when grace and the gospel take root in our hearts, there's going to be effort on our part. That we're going to see the supreme value of Christ and we're going to live differently. And Paul presents this living differently as an, as an athletic event, as a, a sweaty, hardworking thing. Runners um, as a culture are um, a little bit weird. Um, I don't say that in a mean way, but uh, just uh, if, you, if you stand outside of running culture and look into running culture, and I'm not talking about 
like people who, who go jogging and stuff like that, but people who are runners, um, it's kind of a different thing. Um, they get, they've got a weird culture. Um, so like they're always injured, they're always hurt, and, and yet they're, they're still running, um, that they're spending hundreds of dollars on, on running shoes, even though they've been, you know, they've got plenty of running shoes that, there's things called ultra marathons, that the, the um, 26 miles, 300, I think it's 26 miles, 385 yards is a marathon. That they're like, no, that's not enough. We, we need more. We need more. We need 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers. We just want to run for 24 hours. That, that running culture is weird. Um, once again, not being mean, um, my preferred, preferred form of exercise is picking up heavy things and then putting them back down. Um, so there's some weirdness in that. Um, I've, I'm part of a weird culture to some degree, too. But, but runners are committed to running, that um, there is a drive in them that if, if they go a day or two without running, they're like, I, I've just got to go run. I've got to do this. And it's hard work. It's hard. It's, it's, this, it's this interesting mix of it, it's, it's brutal, it's hard on your body, it hurts, and yet if you ask a runner, well, what was the best part of your day? It was when I, I got up and I ran. So when you got up, did you, you like want to run? No. As you started running, did, did, did that feel good? No. About mile three, mile five, at what point does this feel good? Um, don't really know, but that's part of my day. It's just it's this incredible focus. It's this incredible effort. And Paul applies this to the Christian life. That the Christian life is one of discipline. It's one of self-control. It's one of hard work. That we're not just supposed to sit back on our blessed assurances and wait for Jesus to come back. That there is work that he's given us to do. There's, there's work in us because we need to change because we're not like Jesus and we're supposed to be like him. There's work amongst one another that we need to work together with one another to build up the body of Christ, which is the church. There's work beyond us because we've been given this incredible news that the world needs to know, the world is dying to know, and we've got to go share it. That the Christian life is an athletic event in the language that Paul uses. It takes discipline, it takes constant effort. Running, if you want to be good at it, um, really anything if you want to be good at it, is not something you can just show up one day a week and be good. You can get some health benefits from exercising one day a week. You can you get on a treadmill for 30 minutes, and if you haven't been doing anything, they can, they can see difference in your markers. Um, but if you really want to be good at something, you're getting up in three, four, five, six days a week. You're doing that. If you want to be great, there's a discipline that goes into all of your life. And so Paul is presenting this picture that we are to be like a runner, not that's running to re receive an earthly prize. They receive wreaths, um, typically, in, in, in this time. But that we are running to receive Christ, who has already made us his own. So there's the, the effort and the security. There's the... There's the live and be what Christ has already made you. Become what Christ has said you are. There's this effort, there's this, this, this willingness to shed anything that keeps us from getting closer to Christ. The author of, of Hebrews in that passage that we read, he, he says that we should take off sin in order to, to run the race better towards Christ, which is, is obvious. But he doesn't just say that, he says, take off every weight and sin. So even stuff that we couldn't just say, okay, this is, this is sin, and so I should stop doing it. But this distracts me from Christ. This keeps me from running towards Christ like I should. And so it's got to go. We are to approach our life in Christ is this athletic event where we see him as the goal. We, we look forward to that day when we will see him face to face. 
and we run from here to there with everything we've got. Paul presents the Christian life as a race towards Jesus. Verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So Paul presents the Christian life as discipleship within community. Paul presents the Christian life as discipleship within community. This is an interesting way of using example because the example that Paul gives is that we are the examples. Um, we are the examples to one another. Um, Paul says, hey, look, I'm an example to you as I imitate Christ. You imitate that. And then keep your eyes on the other people who are imitating Christ and imitate them also, that within the community of the people of God, we are to imitate one another as we all imitate Christ. I've got lots of books on discipleship. I've been to lots of conferences on discipleship. If you want to talk about different um, discipleship strategies and different tools that we can use and different models and different ways we can measure, um, I, I kind of get excited by that stuff. I can do all that stuff with you. Um, but for all of that, I think Paul's, almost his entire philosophy of discipleship was this. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I think that's almost his entire philosophy of, of discipleship. When you see me imitating Christ, you do that. When I see you imitating Christ, I'm going to do that. I think that's how Paul sees full discipleship. Um, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, Be imitators me, of me as I am of Christ. He says something similar in, in 1 Corinthians 4.16 and Philippians 3. 17 and 1 Thessalonians 1 6 and 2 Thessalonians 3 9 that that he repeats this idea that what we are supposed to be doing is imitating one another as we are all imitating Christ that that's what discipleship is that's how this community works and so in order to do that we've got to be in community that you can't imitate people if, if you're not around people um, that we need to be um, imitating the right people we need to have people that we look up to, um, that we imitate as they imitate Christ. You learn a, a lot about um, imitation, um, having um, three boys, especially um, with a divided age range. Um, Carver's brothers um, will, will look to him, and they think he is just the coolest, and they think everything he says is funny, and they just want to be just like him, especially when he does something wrong. So especially when I, I correct Carver, Carver, please stop doing that, just don't do that at the table. Carver, I'm going to have to take your breadstick away if you don't stop doing it. Carver, just, just eat your breadstick. Their, his brother will immediately take their breadstick and stick their finger up in it or whatever and smile at me. Look, Daddy, I'm doing it too. And we, we, we just have this natural desire um, to imitate. And, and lots of times we, we are, we're drawn towards imitating the bad things more than we are the good things. That that often if you take one person who, who's a hard worker and you combine them with somebody who's lazy, um, the laziness will win out in, in both of them rather than the hard work um, pulling them both forward. That, that we're, we're drawn more towards the bad things lots of times than we are towards the good things. And so we need to be in community with people that we can look up to. It's people who are further down the road than we are. And you know we're all, this can be in different areas that, that some um, Christian men and women might be further in this area than you are, but then, then, then less, and so we can all look to one another. But we have to have those people in our, our lives that, okay, he, he does this well. I want to be more like him because it looks like Jesus. And then we should have people that are looking up to us at different levels of, I want to do this well. So when people see me, that they'll say, that, that looks like Jesus. That's what I want to be like. That's what I, I want to do like. I think that's what Paul pictures this discipleship as a community of believers looking like. Of imitate me as I imitate Christ. So he says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, whom, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They have glory in their shame. 
with minds set on earthly things. And so Paul describes people who are living in worldly ways, um, people who are, are living as enemies of the cross of Christ, people who um, aren't setting their, their focus on Christ, aren't running towards Christ, they're setting their, their focus on the world. Um, and he says they are enemies of the cross of Christ, that their end is destruction, um, that their God is their, their belly. Um, that phrase there doesn't just mean that, that all they think about is, is food. Um, that, that, that could be uh, an illustration of that, but really what Paul is saying is their God is their appetites. Um, whatever it is apart from Christ that's driving their life. Um, so it can be lust, it can be um, a sense of I just want power for myself, I just want material possession um, for myself to the exclusion of, of any thought of good. Um, it can be any of those things that are appetites, that are wrong desires or desires held wrongly that can say that, that their God is their appetite, their God is their belly, that they glory in their shame. So they don't just pursue these things. They just don't pursue things that are wrong according to God. They, they glory in them. They say, look at how good I am at, at doing this, which is dishonorable in the eyes of God. And so he tells us that there's this group that sets their minds on earthly things. Then verse 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Then in chapter 4 he says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So lastly, Paul presents the Christian life as citizenship in heaven. Paul presents the Christian life as citizenship in heaven. Philippi was a Roman colony, and so um, not necessarily every member of the church, but a, a number of the people in this church would have likely been Roman citizens. Um, they would have been citizens of Rome, and, and that um, citizenship gave them rights and it gave them responsibilities, that they um, had rights and responsibilities as citizens of Rome. It was something that, that Paul would even take out um, when he needed to and say, hey, look, I'm a, a Roman citizen, and he would use that um, to his advantage. Today, we are, are all of us citizens of the United States, um, that um, that we have United States citizenship, that that gives us certain rights and responsibilities. But just like the Philippians weren't primarily or, or weren't mainly citizens of Rome, they are citizens of heaven, so too with us. Even though we are citizens of the United States, our, our primary citizenship, our main citizenship is as citizens of heaven. And so um, as citizens of heaven, we have rights and responsibilities that are different than if our citizenship was of this world. Um, he says, don't be like the people who set their minds on the world because our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope, Jesus Christ, is in heaven. Our goal is the resurrection of the dead. He will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Um, he's going to... Um, he's going to take our, our broken, prone to, to pain, prone to, to falling apart, prone to getting old bodies, and re replace them, or not really replace, but transform them into immortal bodies, glorified bodies. Um, and he, he tells them his motivation of all this, that, that they are his joy and his crown. So he's kind of circling back around erasing um, language because, once again, um, as they won a race, the, the winner would get a, a wreath crown. That was kind of um, what they were aiming for. And so um, Paul tells them, look, you are, are my crown. You are what I'm looking for. Um, so he brings us back in into community um, as, as he completes the, 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 the list of illustrations. And Paul also, along with other writers of Scripture, will we use this idea um, that, that this world is ultimately alien 
to us, that we are ultimately aliens, we are strangers, that, that, that we don't um, belong here in the ultra, earthly culture because we're a part of the new creation, that we're a part of, of this new thing that is done in Christ. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, um, Paul says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we're ambassadors. Ambassadors don't do any good staying at home. Ambassadors go to a different country and they represent their, their Lord, their, their government. That's what we are. We're, we're, we're not in heaven, but that's where our citizenship is. And we're ambassadors with a job. We are to represent Christ. We are to implore the world, be reconciled to God through Christ. We have a, a job to do as ambassadors. First Peter um, chapter 2, um, verses 4 and 5, he says this. He says, As you come to him, as you come to Christ, the living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, um, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, so we are now a spiritual house. We are now a holy priesthood. We're now a, a different thing because we are in Christ. He, he goes on building out this analogy um, in verse 9. But you are a chosen race. So in Christ, we are now a new race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That in Christ, we are a new nation. In Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. A people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That we are different, we are to live differently, because we are the people of Christ. And so Paul and the New Testament authors will use all of, of this language, that, that our citizenship is in heaven. That we are aliens and strangers here. That, that this is our temporary dwelling place. That we are a new people, a new nation, a holy priesthood, a new race. We are the people who belong to God. That Paul is presenting the Christian life, and the New Testament authors present the Christian life, as citizenship in heaven as our first allegiance, because we live differently, because we belong to him. And, and in this, Paul once again, contrast this with living for the world. Um, the, the idea of, of living for the world um, shouldn't make any sense to us anymore because we've now seen the value of Christ and know that our citizenship is in him. Jesus uses um, similar language in, in Matthew chapter 16. He says this, he says, for, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will pay each person according to what he has done. So Jesus said, even if you could get the whole world, and there's a lot of stuff in the world, there's a lot of valuable stuff in the world, there's a lot of good stuff in the world, even if you could get all of it, but it costs you your soul. That would be an eternally bad trade. That all of the worth of the world put together and put in your possession would be a bad trade compared to your eternity with Christ. And yet so many people are willing to sacrifice relationship with Christ in, in the short term or relationship with Christ in an eternal sense. Not for the whole world, but for its trinkets. I, I, I could come and I could get this and I know I shouldn't have this. I know I shouldn't do this. 
No, I shouldn't think about this, look at this, pursue this. But it's going to cost me relationship with Christ. I'm not going to be as close to him as I would have been otherwise. And too often we're like, okay, I'll give me the trinket. Jesus says, even the whole world pales in comparison to what it means to be close to me, what it means to, to be eternally with me. So in the same line, Paul says, don't be like the people who are citizens of the world. Don't chase after your, your misdirected appetites, things that try to be gods that aren't. But live as citizens of heaven because that's where our hope is. That's where our allegiance is. That's where our Savior is. That's where our eternity is. Right now, we're just temporarily traveling through this life towards the life that is really real, the life that is really eternal, the life that is with our Savior face to face. Live differently because of this. So Paul gives us these three illustrations, and once again, the middle one is kind of a, an illustration of being an illustration, um, but um, these three ways of looking at the Christian life, and I think each of them is instructive for us, each of them is helpful for us to, to see that, that Christianity is not just this set of beliefs, it's not just this set of things that we can go, yeah, I, I believe that. That there, there's a what next after that. That, that the hard part of a race is, is not lining up at the finish line, or lining up, lining up at the, the starting line. Too, action, too often we, we picture that that's all of Christianity. Okay, I've gotten to the starting line. That, that's the whole race. No, the, the race is, is the race. You're, you're at the starting line. You're to run with everything you've got because you've got a goal that's better than any earthly goal. that we got to be in community because we've got to look to other people and go, he's, he's doing this like Christ really well and I don't want to be like that. And, and there should be people behind me that say, Kevin's doing this well. I want to be more like that because it looks like Jesus. That we realize that our ultimate allegiance, our ultimate Lord is not here on earth, but it's in heaven. So every day we... We pursue this. Every day we set this as our goal because our goal is Christ. So the praise team comes back up to lead us in worship one more time. If you'd like to come and talk with me or pray with me, um, I'll be down by the cross as they sing. Um, but I will pray for us now. Um, then they will lead us in, in the worship. And I'll be um, down by, by the cross if you'd like to come and talk with me or pray with me. I'd love to do that with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you once again um, that you've revealed yourself to us in your word. Um, Lord, that you have, have shown us how we are to live as your people. Lord, that you yourself came to live as our example. Lord, that you yourself came to die to purchase us as your people. Lord, that you yourself rose again to let us know that you are God and that eternal life lies in you. Or that you yourself offer us this incredible news that if we will just trust in you, not only will our sins be forgiven, but you will call us your very own possession. And so Lord, help us to see these illustrations, to see these examples, and help us to live as the people that you died to create. Lord, help us to run with everything we have towards you because you are a good goal. You are an infinitely amazing reward. Lord, help us to be examples to one another and look to one another as, as examples as we all imitate you. And Lord, remind us that our, that our ultimate citizenship, our ultimate allegiance, our ultimate hope not found anywhere here, 
rather it's found as citizens of your kingdom in heaven. Lord, bless us with this today and every day. And it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings You don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry When I just go through the motions I'm sorry I just sing another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart I'm sorry When I come with my agenda I'm sorry I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Father, we just want you, no one except you. Sing this with us. Just want you, oh, nothing else, oh, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, oh, nothing else. Oh, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Oh, nothing else. Oh, nothing else. Nothing else will do. We just want you. Oh, nothing else. Oh, nothing else. Nothing else will do We just want you Oh, nothing else Oh, nothing else Nothing else will do We just want you Oh, nothing else Oh, nothing else Nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I 
just want you Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, as usual, I just wanted to take a quick second to thank you for being here today at the bridge and welcome you again to the bridge. Um, you know, when Kevin was uh, doing his sermon there, I, I couldn't help but think about uh, my youngest son. And uh, he's grown with wife and kids of his own now and everything. But um, he was born with, with flat feet. And, and I don't mean, you know, we say, yeah, that guy's got flat feet. He truly had flat feet, no arch whatsoever almost. And so it was not easy for him to run fast or run long distances or anything. And so it, it was kind of surprising that uh, when he was in high school, he said, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try out for the track team. And uh, I was like, well, okay, well, that, that's great. But, uh, and in my mind, I was thinking, Adam, what? what? Why do you want to do that? But, you know, I wasn't going to say that. But, uh, and so he did. And, uh, 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 and, and on that year, everybody made the team. And he, he made the team there. And um, so uh, the first race uh, went out. And uh, so uh, and he, he did long distance running, which, I, again, was I'm not sure where you're going with this. He finished the race. And the next race, he finished the race, and he finished the race, and he finished the race. And, and, and you know, one time he told me, he said, said, Dad, I know I'm not going to win this race. You know, I, I know I'm not going to come in first in this race. But he said, I'm going to finish. And by golly, he did. Every race he ran, he finished it, and he never finished last. And that, that was an inspiration to me. And, and I, I think that's what, what Paul was talking about here, that, that sometimes when we think about racing analogies, we think about getting to the end and getting our trophy and holding it up. Look what we did. That's not what Paul was saying. B because Christ has already won the race. He did that on the cross. The race is already won. It's how we run the race. And it, with a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to run that race to be more like Him. We do things to be more like Him. Because the race is already won. It's not about us. It's about Him. And for me, that's what Paul was talking about. It's how we run the race. It's how we live our lives in Christ. Not because of us but because of what he's done for us there. And, and so, Kevin, thank you again for another excellent sermon there. And, and I think that that, uh, that that sermon points out something that we talk about all the time here, and that's relationship. Relationship with Jesus Christ. And, uh, uh, and that brings us to our next part of our service, and, and that's our offering. We take an offering here not out of obligation, but out of relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're visiting with us for the first time, your presence here is your offering. We expect nothing more. If you're a regular attender or a member, we'll ask you to follow Christ in that. We'll have James will be bringing a basket around in just a second there. But uh, again, thank you for being here today at the bridge, and welcome to the bridge. You're always welcome at the bridge, not because of anything you've done or we've done, but because of the cross and what Christ has done. Hey guys, when that plate goes by, let's stand up and sing this new song that we're going to sing today. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around There ain't no way you'll ever let me down Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I Without your mercy Praising your name at the 
top of my lungs. Tell me, is it good? He's good. Tell me, is it God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? Like sun in the morning, I know you're gonna be there every day. So what on earth would make me be afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I Praise Him when the sun goes down. Love Him in the morning. Love Him in the noon. Love Him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you find me. Praising Your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'll be without Your mercy. Praising Your name at the top of my in the noontime. Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noontime. Jesus when the sun goes down. Y'all have a good week. <laughs>